One of the important events of the fourth year of Hijrah, of the migration, is the prohibition of alcoholic drinks. The Arabian Peninsula, just like many societies at the time, was heavily dependent on wine. In fact, the pagans of Mecca, their pastime was to get together late afternoons, evenings, in a session, in a gathering, get drunk all night long. And this was common, it was part of their lifestyle. So most people were addicted to drinking, it was part of their culture, part of their life. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His divine religions, He outlawed anything that intoxicates you because the greatest gift that God has given us is the intellect. Getting drunk imposes a barrier on the intellect and it's an insult to this gift that Allah has given you. That's like someone giving you a precious gift and then you deliberately do something which prevents you from using that gift. That's an insult to the one who gifted to you <coughs> that gift. Allah has given you the intellect out of billions of His creations. Just think about that for that moment. How many things are there in existence in this universe? You've seen those uh, maps or videos where it starts on a small object on the planet. Sometimes it starts from like a cell or a subatomic particle and then the video zooms out, it zooms out, you see the planet and then you see the solar system and then you see the galaxy and then our galaxy even disappears in this huge universe. How many billions and trillions and trillions of beings God has created? How many of those has God given the intellect? Several billion, right? Out of these trillions and trillions, God chose you for the intellect. And I have the audacity to get drunk and put a barrier on this intellect. That's an insult to Allah. Think about it, it's an insult to the Almighty God. That's why Islam is very strict with intoxicating drinks. And Islam did not fight a food or a drink like alcohol because it really boils down to that. Let alone the negative consequences, the accidents, the deaths, the crimes that result because of uh, uh, being drunk. Here in the United States every single year over 90,000 Americans die because of the influence of alcohol. 90,000 lives are being claimed because of either drunk driving or drunk related accidents or events. That's an insult to the Creator, an insult to humanity. So Islam realized that in the Arabian Peninsula, drinking wine, whether it was grape wine or date wine, it was rampant, it was common. Now Allah decided in Medina to ban alcohol because now the timing was appropriate. How did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do that? Through four verses. See, alcohol is so ingrained in people's lives. It's so difficult to break away from it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala trained Muslims through four verses to stop drinking. But the system that God used and the approach that He used is impeccable. It's amazing and it's a lesson for all of us whenever we're trying to help others change or bring a new idea that people resist. So we find that in the first stage, the, ho the Holy Quran simply wants to awaken people to know that alcohol is not that healthy, it's not that good. You have to awaken the minds as a first step, psychologically prepare the people let them see another perspective and give them time to see that other perspective. Because people in that society thought wine is fine, it's okay. Listen to the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala words this first verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah An-Nahl, chapter 16, verse 67, He states, وَمِن ثَمَرَاتِ النَّخِيلِ وَالْأَعْنَابِ And from the fruits of palm trees and grape, تَتَّخِذُونَ مِنْهُ سَكَرًا وَرِزْقًا حَسَنًا You people, you take the date and the grapes, you either تَتَّخِذُونَ مِنْهُ سَكَرًا which means you derive intoxicating drinks from them, from dates or from grapes, 
Or what is the other side that Allah mentions? Or you use it wisely, you take it as good sustenance. See, in this verse, Allah is not condemning alcohol. He's not saying it's bad, it's evil, I'll punish you for it, it's this or that. Allah is saying, <laughs> grapes have two uses. It has a rizq hasan, it has a good use and it has an intoxicating use. See the soft approach Allah uses to awaken the conscience? Because people need to be ready, they're used to it. So prepare them psychologically, prepare the grounds. Tell them that grapes have multiple uses. One is rizq hasan. The minute you say hasan, automatically you're teaching their psychology and subconscious that intoxicating drinks are not rizq hasan. See the beauty of the Quran? It's an amazing way when you talk to people. I myself, I've tried it, especially with people who come for counseling. Sometimes they're on a negative path or they're doing something wrong in a relationship. Now you know if you directly tell them you're wrong, they might not take it well. So the way that you approach it is, okay in that situation, a good way of handling it would have been X, Y and Z. That would be a better way, that would be a good way of dealing with your spouse. Now indirectly you're telling the person that what he did was not the good way. There is a better way. So you're educating that person that what you're doing is wrong, but you're using such a soft tone and approach such that the person is willing to accept. But if you tell them no, what you did was wrong, he's right, she's right, he's not going to accept. You need to psychologically prepare him that there is a better way. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling people, look, there's a better way to use grapes and dates than making alcohol. There's a better way, rizqan hasanan, good way. Indirectly Allah is teaching them what you're doing is a bad way. But see how soft it is? Even though Islam is so sensitive with intoxicating drinks, but Allah uses such a soft verse in Surah an nahl That's amazing and phenomenal in the Holy Quran. And always when you're dealing with people, take this approach. If it's the first time they're exposed to this idea, you want to alert them that they're doing something wrong, use it so softly as a first step to encourage them to see the better side. So you don't have to necessarily put down their side, just show them the better side. And by the way, this is also very effective when you're speaking to other Muslims about our school of thought and the Ahlul Bayt. You don't necessarily as a first step need to go and condemn and denounce the figures that they believe in. Show them the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. Show them the Ahlul Bayt. I remember I was, wasn't, I was once in Vancouver when we had some brothers from other schools of thought and there was a discussion. So I mentioned the following. I just stated it out there. I said we have two leaders. You can follow this leader or that leader. One leader, when he would stand in the Friday prayer, he would be flapping his you know, garment, waving it like that to dry it. He was asked, why are you doing that? He said, I only have one piece of garment. On Fridays, I wash it. I didn't have time for this to dry. I am coming here to the Friday prayer. And now as I'm giving the sermon, I was fluttering it against the wind to dry it. This is one leader of the Muslim Ummah. And there's another leader who when he died, he was found with 8 million golden dinars in his palace. That's all I said. I said that one who was fluttering and waving his garment in the wind was Ali ibn Abi Talib salam when he was the Khalifa at the Friday sermon. And the one who died with 8 million dinars was Uthman. Who's better to follow? They were shocked. See, I did not go and condemn and curse. No, just put these two. This is better. Eventually, if they're honest and not stubborn, it will work. It's a no-brainer.
that this is the one chosen by Allah. If one of these two has to be chosen by Allah, it's this one. And if you say they're both, both chosen by Allah, which God chooses this and that? Why? You know, that, that, that's so random that you choose these types of leaders. Be consistent. Be consistent with the type of leaders that you give us. Either that one's better or this one's better. You can't put these two contradicting figures and say, no, they're both your caliphs. That's an inconsistent God. I don't have respect for a God who does that. I need consistency from my Lord. <laughs> Prophet Dawood or Sulaiman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, well we have, a, we have a response for that. They were assigned as kings by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the money that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them was not by taking the money from the people. Whereas Uthman, he supposedly was following the sunnah of the Prophet. The sunnah of the Prophet was not the sunnah of Dawood and Sulaiman. The Prophet said, my caliphs follow my sunnah. So he was not following the sunnah of the Prophet. Whose sunnah was he following? Sulaiman who authorized him. We're trying to figure out who represents Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The sharia of Sulaiman is not applicable to me. And besides that money was the money of the Muslims. Yeah, if it was his own money. Yeah, so that's the response that we give. Remember Prophet Dawood, do you know how he became rich? How did he become rich? Super rich. No, not overnight. No, no, had nothing to do with the jinn. How did he become super rich? He made 360,000 dirhams in one year. How do you do that? No, no hints? What is that? <laughs> no, not real estate. He would sell something every day. Exactly, the armor, the shield. Allah allowed Prophet Dawood to touch iron and it would become soft for him. So he would use this gift given to him by Allah to produce a dir, an armor or shield every single day. And he would sell it for 1,000 dirhams each day. In one year he made 360,000 silver coins. That's how he became rich. He wasn't confiscating money from people. Uthman, ya Allah what, what, what did he do? What was his job? If that's money that he made on his own as a businessman, fine, that's his halal. But that money was taken from the Muslims. So which one is a better leader? So the idea in this beautiful verse is teach people how to think properly. Give them two scenarios and tell them as a first step to psychologically prepare them, tell them which is better. I remember we had discussions about this whole gender crisis, right? Choosing multiple genders, homosexuality. One effective way in addressing this is which one is more functional in society. Having an infinite number of genders that you can choose from and it confuses your life and it leads to a number of psychological problems because now you have an identity crisis or the fact that there are two genders which makes it very clear cut, much less confusion, much less psychological consequences, which one's healthier? Ask people that way, you see them, they'll, they'll start thinking. When you put the burden on people to choose what gender they want, you're doing an injustice to them because it's, it's too big of a burden. That's why our youth today have a crisis, they don't know what they are, they don't know what they are. So just ask the following question, which is better? To have something <laughs> that's stable, fixed, it's not that confusing, gives you a sense of identity, or something that is just so burdensome and you have no clue these days, you go on college campuses, there are a thousand genders to choose from. It's making our youth suffer. It's one reason for depression. It's one reason for suicide. It's one reason for social isolation because they have an identity crisis. They don't know what they are because they're told you get to choose any gender, invent it overnight, you have the right. Well, when you put that burden on people, there's negative consequences. See the way you tackle it as a first step, it gets people to think, which is better? And sometimes when I have these discussions with those people, I say the, the, the relationship that Allah wants for us, Allah saying, look, this is better. The nuclear family, husband, wife, from an opposite gender, having a family, having offsprings from that same marriage, that is better for you. It's healthier, it works better. That in itself does wonders when you prepare them psychologically, yes.
based on what you just mentioned, say, and this is sometimes I ponder upon. So God has given me the intellect, you know, the presence of some folks like Omar Uthman or Abu Bakr or Imam Ali. Would this be perhaps a stage where God is trying to work on your intellect to see, to tell the difference from, from, uh, from right from wrong? So the presence of such individuals actually puts your mind to more thought to think something is really obvious in front of you as far as the bigger purpose goes. Sometimes I think about it. If these three individuals are as far as whatever happened in history would not have existed and it would have just been a successive uh, follow through. It's not money. Then would the human intellect be trained as much? See, not? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his system is not to give you the haqq and the truth on a golden platter. Why? For this reason. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to use the intellect at reaching, in reaching at guidance. So yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will present us with these historical situations. So we investigate, use our intellect and choose that which is right. And that's why there is some vagueness in religion. Even the Quran has ayat mutashabihat, vague verses that can go either way. Why? To test us, to see if we use our intellect, if we take the right path. So the truth is not always given to us so clearly and God has done all the work for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the tools. Through these tools, which is the intellect primarily, we can find the truth. So yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deliberately does that. In fact, Musa and the Holy Quran is very clear. In hiya illa fitna took. He says, oh Allah, this is the fitna you've created. This trial, this controversy. Why? To test people. So some are guided, some are misguided. So yes, the, the idea is to use that intellect. And see this beautiful verse here in the Quran, it's inviting the intellect to think. I have grapes, I have dates. One way is sakaran, intoxicating drinks. But one way is good rizq. Which one's better? Ask the intellect. See how Allah invited the people to keep away from alcohol? It's, a, it's an amazing way. If you think about the psychology of the Quran and how effective it is. Yes. I mean, so that's uh, sometimes I get surprised at the folks from our school of thought, as far as the Shia school of thought, where they have um, essentially emotions and feelings towards these personalities to the extent where they say they shouldn't have existed altogether. No, no, their existence was absolutely. That's like you taking a multiple choice exam and then saying those three wrong answers should not have existed. Well, in other words, you're saying that test should not have existed. Because if you eliminate all the wrong answers in the multiple choice test, what do you have? Anything you choose is right? That's a joke, that's not a test. So their presence is necessary to uh, inspire the intellect to find the truth and that's how the test of Allah works. So those who say that it's out of ignorance or a shallow understanding of the system of God. Or I remember once, uh, you know, there was this, this discussion about shaitan and the tactics of shaitan and this young man got frustrated and he said, I wish the devil didn't exist. <laughs> he said it with frustration. Well, there's a reason why he exists. So that's the first verse about intoxicating drinks. The second verse, Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 219. يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْخَمْرِ وَالْمَيْسِرِ They ask you about khamr, wine or alcohol, and games of chance, gambling. قُلْ فِيهِمَا إِثْمٌ وَمَنَافُعُ لِلنَّاسِ وَإِثْمُهُمَا أَكْبَرُ مِنْ نَفْعِهِمَا As a second step, now that people realized, okay, maybe intoxicating drinks aren't the best use of God's rizq. The second verse is stronger, comes at a next step. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, they ask you about wine and games of chance, say, there is ithim in them, there is a great sin in them. See now the Quran is more direct to get them to know that no, wine is bad. But now the argument is, but there are benefits. There are benefits from wine. Economic benefits, like what? Billions of dollars. Billions of dollars are generated from the wine industry, from the beer industry. 
So some people say, well, why are you banning it when we're getting money out of this? The Meccans would get money out of this. Others would get money out of this. So the Quran says, yes, there are benefits for people like financial incentives, economic benefits. However, the negative side, the dark side, the sin outweighs the benefits. The harms outweigh the benefits. See now Allah is teaching people to think properly. Okay, you have a case here, wine. There are some benefits in it, no doubt about that. But because the harms outweigh the benefits, the intellect says keep away from it. Keep away from it. Why are you on a diet and you don't eat what your nafs desires? Yeah, there are benefits to these foods. You enjoy it, you like it, they taste good right? But you know the harm is greater. If I keep eating this for years, I'll end up with, I don't know, diabetes, I'll end up with a stroke, with elevated cholesterol. So what does the intellect say? Exercise judgment here. Be very careful. So Allah is teaching people how to think when it comes to alcohol. Now today you'll find some doctors saying, no, 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 this is good for the heart. A glass of wine is good for the heart. First of all, I dispute that. I'll tell you why, not because I'm a medical expert, but because usually that wine, the red wine that is taken from grapes, it's healthy not because it's wine, because it's grape juice. Because grape, as the hadith says, is good for the heart. See how they twist the reality? Just say grape juice is good for you. Why insist that wine made from grapes is good for you? Yeah, there is grapes in there and that's why it's good for the heart. But it doesn't have to be in wine form. Drink grape juice, the hadith says it's good for the heart. In fact, one beautiful hadith states, يُفَرَّحُ الْقَلْبِ it, it, it helps with depression. It even helps with your mood, eating grapes or grape juice. Assuming, assuming there is a health benefit to wine specifically, fine. We recognize that there's a benefit, but the harm is greater. So the Quran is teaching you to think. Don't say, okay, there's a benefit to this, like these days. No, 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 there are some benefits to marijuana even medical benefits to marijuana, right? What about the harms? <laughs> Subhanallah, the Quran speaks every single day, even in our modern society. I hear people saying, no, no, Wallah say it. I went and I read 20 benefits to marijuana. Really? 20 benefits to marijuana. What about the 200 harms? Did you read those? <laughs> so the Quran says, we recognize there are some benefits for people, but the ithm, the sin, the harm is greater than the benefits. Wouldn't another way to interpret this verse of Surah Al-Baqarah be no matter how many goods you can find, the spiritual sin that you're accruing is way, way worse for you both in dunya and in akhirah. So forget about the, the one-sided dunya approach. You're getting a whole lot more harm, uh, not, not just health-wise, but like ithm as in sin, like stuff that's it's taking over your life. We, we can see the verse that way, stating that, okay, there may be worldly benefits, but the fact that you're sinning and you're destroying your akhirah and you'll be punished in the akhirah, that's greater than the material gain that you're getting in this world. That is one way to look at it. But my understanding of the verse, the way that the Quran is training people to think is even in this world it has greater harms. See, because the Quran says, النَّاسِ It does have benefits. And it, it doesn't seem from the verse that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the hereafter. Allah is even educating us on how to live properly. So yes, there might be some benefits for you here in this world, but here in this world, the harms are greater. It seems the Quran is pointing them towards that. It seems. It could be applicable to what you mentioned, but the direct impression they would get is in this world. That Allah saying here, even in this world, there are there are greater you know uh, sins, there are greater harms. Yes, there are greater consequences. So after Allah Subhanahu wa Taala revealed this verse, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf he arranged a feast, and they served wine in that party in that gathering. Those who were present at that gathering, they started to pray at the time of salah while drunk. 
So the Muslims realize that now there are harms in alcohol. But the Quran still fell short of directly prohibiting people from drinking. The Quran still did not call it haram yet, right? The Quran is just giving us advice at this point. So the second step, give people advice, tell them that there are some benefits but the harms are greater, take that advice. So the Quran is now giving us advice. So some Muslims took that advice but a lot of them didn't. And therefore we see Abdul Rahman ibn Auf throwing this party and Muslims went to his house and they got drunk even though they knew there were some harms in it. But maybe in their minds, well, it's not haram. We don't want to take God's advice, fine. <laughs> maybe that's how they thought. So the time of salah came and one of them got up to recite prayer. Because he was drunk, he misread Surah Al-Kafirun. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Qul ya ayyuhal kafirun, la a'budu ma ta'budun. I do not worship what you worship, right? O oh, disbelievers, O oh, kuffar, I do not worship what you worship. Because he was under the influence of alcohol, he said, Ya ayyuha al-kafirun, a'budu ma ta'budun. He omitted the no, the la. So now this becomes a disbelief. You worship what the kafirs worship. So he said that, and this incident made the pious Muslims realize, wait a minute, it's not okay to pray under the influence of alcohol to be drunk and pray because now you could say things out of line, you'll play around with the Quran and it's not acceptable. So some did see it that way but maybe some others still didn't care. So in the third step Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah An-Nisa which is chapter 4 verse 46, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O you believers, la taqrabu salata wa antum sukara, you have no right to start praying while you are drunk. This is an insult to your salah because being drunk might make you say something out of line. You need to know exactly what you're saying. So in this verse Allah says when you pray, you have to be sound. You have to know exactly what you're saying, be sober. So this, in this third step, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala limited the times in which people could drink alcohol, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly declared it haram to pray while drunk. But what about outside of prayer? The Quran is still not making that final command yet. Yeah, it's bad, don't, but Allah has still did not declare it haram. So if a person got drunk at 7 a.m., let's say, but by the time the time for dhuhr had come, they were still not clearly making a violation. The Quran at this stage is encouraging people to keep away from being drunk while praying and Allah is practically training them because Allah knows overnight you can't stop that addiction. So reduce. Now that you have five prayers, the amount of time, the window that you have to get drunk is much smaller, right? So now this discourages people from drinking or the, it limits the amount that they will drink. So in this third step, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the believers not to pray while drunk. Okay, what happened after that? After this incident, there were a group of people who gave up drinking permanently. They're like, you know, this is not appropriate. The Quran has already given us advice. It's not a good type of sustenance. And at the time of Salah, we should not get drunk. Khalas, just get this wine out of my life. There were some righteous Muslims who reached that conclusion. However, others still continue to drink, other Muslims. They're like, well, we still have a small window. We could still pray and be believers and still drink. So you had now two groups of Muslims here. Now, one of the Ansar, conducted a party in his house, let's say, or an invitation in his house, a gathering, and wine was served at that gathering. Those Muslims who had given up wine, they were not comfortable with this. They're like, okay, you know, you're serving wine, we could get drunk and then we could pray in the state of being drunk, 
they felt really uncomfortable and they felt it offensive by that Ansari to do this because they expected him to respect the recommendation of the Quran. So they came to the Prophet and they complained. They said, you know, Ya Rasulullah, we went at this gathering and wine was being served in front of us. Can you do something about it? Is it completely haram? Can we drink a little bit? So people were still confused when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed so, uh, verse 90 of Surah Al-Ma'idah in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states clearly wine, gambling and uh, the idols that the pagans would supplicate to, the Azlam which was a type of lottery that they would use. This is a spiritual disease and uncleanliness from shaitan. You have to keep away from that. Allah finally gives the final injunction in the fourth, in the fourth verse that wine is haram, prohibition from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this made it clear to every Muslim that you have no right to drink from now on. So this is the beautiful approach that the Holy Quran takes when treating a very difficult issue like that. Awakens the mind, the intellect, then it makes you think. Allah encourages believers, calculate, think, which is better? The harms, the benefits, which outweighs the other? Think about that. Then practically, Give people some time to get used to the new law. Don't ban it overnight. People won't accept it, they're addicted to it. And then in the fourth stage, make it very clear that this is unacceptable. And that's how the religion of Islam banned alcohol and all these intoxicating drinks.